And attorneys, wait, call the jury. Yes, yes. Your Honor. Mr. Strickland. Good afternoon, Mr. Taylor. Good afternoon. You've sat through this entire trial, right? Yes. And all of the witnesses that testified, you've known before this trial what they were going to say, right? Not necessarily. Many of them gave recorded conversations to the police, didn't they? Yes. You've had an opportunity to listen to those? Yes. Almost everyone the police talked to, they made a written memorandum, didn't they? Yes. You've had an opportunity to read those, right? Yes. You've watched all the videos that surveillance uh, that the police obtained? Yes. So you've known before you walked in here today exactly what the evidence was going to be against you. Is that right? An accurate reflection? Not an Yeah. And you've had the opportunity to come up with a story to explain every single thing that happened, haven't you? No. Isn't that exactly what you've done here? Fed this jury a line? No. Told them a tale that absolutely is not true? No. You sent, you had Alex in your phone as uh, Alex Alejandro, is that right? Yes. Why Alejandro? Um, because we both liked uh, the Mexican culture, the Latin culture, and that was his nickname. And did you call him Alex Alejandro? Uh, in jest, we would call each other our nick. I mean, my real name is not Mark, but he called me Mark. And his real name was not Alejandro, but I believe Alexander in Spanish is Alejandro. And on December 20th, you sent him a text message. Do you remember that? Yes. What time was that? Uh, approximately 9 o'clock. About 9.30, according to the phone records, right? Sounds you right. what that message was? Um, I believe it was a pre-scheduled message. What did it say? Uh, it said that uh, to be ready. Mm -hmm. What if did you it say? Need, if you needed anything, well, let, let me know. Uh, cleaning up, headed to trust. Let me know if you need anything. Right. It said, cleaning up, then headed to trust. Let me know if you need a ride. Yes. Right? He was already dead when you sent that text message. Uh, at that time, yes. And then you sent other messages, right? Other text messages to him? Yes. On the 21st? Such as? I'm asking you, did you send him other text messages? I don't remember. You heard Detective Joe Sisson testify about your phone records? Yes. About the things that they pulled off of your phone, the text messages that you sent, the phone calls that you made? Yes. You don't dispute any of that? They recorded. So on the 21st, uh, you also sent a text message to Alex Alejandro, Vominos Bro. Remember that? Yes. That was after he was dead. Right? Yes. After he was at the river? I didn't know he was at the river. While you were at trust, you okay. sent that message. You knew he was dead, right? Yeah. And then you called him. Remember that? You said you called him on his cell phone. I don't remember it, no. You don't recall calling him? No. Call log shows a phone call to Alex Alejandro, December 21st at not, uh, excuse me, 9.41 p.m., counting backwards. That would be in the morning after he was already dead, right? I don't know why I'd make a text message at 9 in the morning to Alex. I don't know why you'd make a phone call to a dead man, Mr. Taylor. Objection. Why'd you make a phone oh. call to a dead man? I don't think it was on purpose. And then you sent him another text message on the morning of December 21st at 5.45 a.m. Do you remember that one? No? No. Well, according to your phone records on December 21st at 5.45 a.m., you sent a text message to Alex Alejandro that said early, Monday early. Remember 
that? If yes. I, if the records reflected, then yes. So you sent a dead man a text message? Again, I don't. No, I don't. Uh, I don't know. I didn't send it. I didn't remember sending it. But you knew it was dead. At that time, yes. And you were sending him text messages, right? If the records show, then yes. And then you called him on the 22nd of December at 3.23. You remember calling him on the, on the 22nd? No. And then you called him on the 23rd at 12.28. Remember calling him then? No. What would be your purpose in calling and texting a dead man? I don't... I don't know. Could it be that you were trying to cover up what you had done? Um, I think that everything was was recorded. Um, cover up? No. By no means. I can understand you saying that maybe one was a you didn't mean to call him, but Mr. Taylor, three phone calls to the dead man? Are you sure that wasn't just to divert the police, to make them think that you too were interested in finding out where Alex Johnson was? Um, if I knew that he was dead, then I knew that I was also the last person to be with him. So putting the police off on a random trail, uh, there's, there's no point in that. I'm already a suspect. What do you mean, if you knew he was dead? You knew he was dead, didn't you? Yes. You're the one that killed him, aren't you? Yeah. You, know? oh. you also text a guy named Steve N. in your phone. Yes. On December 27th. Who is Steve N.? Steve Newell is uh, the head of the ABC for the Kentucky State Police. So is he law enforcement? Yes. And what did you text him on December 27th? I believe we were discussing um, Alex and his disappearance. What did you ask him? Could you refresh my memory? Yes. On the 27th of December, you sent a text message to someone you identified as Steve N. How can I give you an anonymous tip? There you go. What was the anonymous tip going to be about? About what happened to Alex. About what happened to Alex or just about Alex? About what happened to Alex. So what is this a law enforcement person that you do trust? The best I can, yes. So what was the purpose of giving an anonymous tip? Um, at that point, the family was grieving. Uh, I... Go ahead. I'm extremely sorry about what happened to the man. I, he was my best friend. He was somebody who we made thousands and thousands of dollars together. And it was the best way I could think of to give the police a trail, something to go on. So let me just read this exchange with you. Okay? Please. You text Steven and you say, how can I give you an Anon tip? And his response is, just tell me. And then you text him and say, answer. And then you text him and say, that missing guy Johnson is a huge pot dealer. 30,000 K plus dude dealing from Nashville, Louisville, Knoxville. He, he's who I get mine from. Just tell me how that helps the grieving family find their son. Is there more? No, there's not. There's no, there's, there's no more. more oh, there's more text, but I'm asking you, how does that help the grieving family find their son? Um, it was something that was unknown to the family. And so telling the police that the dead guy sells a bunch of pot helps in some way to find him? How? I don't know. The rest of the ones to Steve in during that same conversation wasn't in his business like that. He took regular trips to Knoxville, Asheville, and Louisiana. Wasn't in his business like that. He took regular trips to Knoxville, Asheville, and Louisiana. Super low-key dude, but dealt by the 4K pound. How does that help the grieving family find their son? That's an accurate reflection of, of Alex. 
But you're telling me and this jury that you contacted law enforcement because you wanted to help in some way to let them know what had happened. Yes. That doesn't help at all, does it? Does it's it? it's contact with law enforcement, which is far more than anything else I had done at that point. You could just pick up the phone and call them, right? No. Give an anonymous tip that you should look at Timothy Ballard, that you should look at the videos of trust, that you should look at the videos of spare parts. They're all going to show you. Yeah. You didn't do any of that. No. In fact, you actually call the police again, or call these law enforcement guy again, to divert them away from you, right? No. You've heard testimony of the witnesses. This barrel here, this one with the holes in it, you arranged to have that barrel come to your garage, right? Yes. You were the one that punched the holes into it. Yes. And you've offered the explanation to this jury that that was so that you could burn trash in it, right? Yes. There's another explanation, isn't there, Mr. Taylor? No. You don't think that by punching holes in this barrel and putting your dead friend's body in there, it would sink to the bottom of the river? No. That is one explanation, isn't it? Yes. You asked Timothy Ballard to get a hold of a truck, to borrow a truck, didn't you? Um, no. You had access to a truck at your garage, right? It's my cousin's. Andrews, it's not necessarily something that I use a lot. It's his work truck, so. Right. You can borrow that. Surely your brother would let you borrow his truck, of course. right? Of course. But you needed Ballard to get a truck that wasn't Andrews, right? No. You didn't want to pull Andrew into this, did you? To the extent that you could avoid it. True. So in advance of killing your friend, you asked your employee, Timothy Ballard, to borrow a truck that you could use that night, right? No. And in fact, after you were done with this truck, you followed him back to return the truck, right? I did. I mean, you're telling us that you had just seen the most horrific thing happen that you had nothing to do with, and you get in the car and follow the guy back to the place where he borrowed the truck? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense, does it? Why not? If you were so afraid to warn him, you could have driven off in another direction, right? Yes. You could have gone back to the garage, kept him from coming in? Yes, I could have. And you didn't do any of that? No. Because that's not how it happened, right? No. And then after all of this happens, after you've killed Alex, you go to trust, right? Remember what time to get there? I believe it was 11.50. 11.40. And you recall what you were doing when you got there at Trust? Yeah, I was blowing up, which means I was high on MDMA. Mm -hmm. You look dressed up, right? You've gone back, changed clothes, put on a jacket, put on a clean shirt, right? Yes. Went down there to Trust. And I want to show you a picture of just what you look like, the video of just what you look like that night, okay? okay. Please, yes, ma'am. These, these as well. Okay. Okay. You see that? 
Who's that? Right That's, here. Uh, who's that? Who's that guy in the collared shirt and the jacket? It's me. Right. Who's the big guy in these? Uh, looks like a sweatshirt or t-shirt. That's Tiny. Uh, Mr. Ballard, your employee. It goes by the name Tiny. Yeah. He's not. He's not worthy of the title, Mr. Ballard, is he? To you. Uh, he was called Tim a lot of times. I get the impression, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that you think Mr. Ballard's beneath you. Um, no. Why you not? think, you don't think he's of your station in life, do you? No, he just needed help at that time. And when asked if he was a social friend of yours, do you remember what your response was? No. No, just like that, yeah. no. no. Not good enough for you, was he? Uh, he was just socially awkward, his size, uh, things like that. He was, he, he wasn't really conversational. He wasn't a people person. Right. And, and in a social scene, he would stick out like a sore thumb. And didn't dress so nice either, did he? Uh, not because of lack of effort. Sort of like Mr. Johnson, you didn't approve of his attire that night either, did you? Uh, that was discussed prior. I had clothes for him. So you had to help Mr. Johnson dress appropriately? I mean, considering the, the place, this is one of the the high-end bars in Lexington, and uh, they don't usually let you in unless you look at least some sort of part, at least a button-down. There are only a few club, clubs like it in Lexington that, that have a dress code such as that. Who is that that just came into the frame? Me. What are you doing? Uh, I just looked to see if DJ Crow was spinning, and he was. And you were dancing? Yes. Having a good time? Yes. Yeah. Moving back and forth to the music? Yes. Right? Is that that involuntary response you were telling us about? Essentially, yeah. Is laughing also an involuntary response? Um, being euphoric and feeling yes. Having a good time, is that an involuntary response? It's a byproduct. Counting out the cash that you just got from Alex's apartment, no. is that an involuntary response? No. So what's happening now? Just waiting to be let in. Waiting to be let in. By how? Do you pay to go in there? Um, usually when you buy a bottle or a table, you're allowed 10, 15 people entry without cover. And you had bought a table or a bottle that night, right? Yeah, for $100. Okay. So your $100 allowed you to have like a VIP kind of area? Just, a, just an area. Special treatment? Uh, a server. Yeah, that make you feel pretty important? No. And what are they putting on the wrist, wrist there? Uh, wristband. Okay. So you were waiting to get your wristbands before you could go inside? Yeah. Okay. And you understood you needed to do that, right? I mean, we could have proceeded in, but it's just courtesy to wait. And okay. So you weren't so high that you didn't understand courtesy and waiting, right? I mean, if you want to, I didn't stop moving my hands. I was very... You were um, very excited, weren't you? Because you just killed your friend, or by your version, seen your friend killed, right? Yes. And this is how people act when they've seen that happen. Oh. You see this man right here, this large gentleman. Yes, that would be Mr. Ballard. I just saw him take a baton to my best friend. And that's why I see you running out the door in fear, right? Uh, it's also to pacify the man. He has a weapon on him at the time. It's the same baton that he used. He has keys to my house. Uh, objection, Your Honor. I'm not asking Mr. Taylor a question at all. Just respond to the question, sir. Okay. 
So where are you now? This is the area, uh, the mid section of the bar. You see this man? Your Honor, I've not asked Mr. Taylor a question. Apologize. What is Mr. Ballard doing? Sitting in the corner. And where are you? Uh, I just said hello to the DJ. Okay. Crow. <coughs> and is that you that has just come back into the frame? Yeah. How much money did you spend that night at Trust? $250. How much money did you have in your pocket? We could turn up the lights. A couple thousand. cleaned your apartment in the past? Yes. And you asked him to do that between 3 and 4 in the morning? Uh, yeah. It's kind of an odd time to have someone clean your garage, don't you think? Not when you're up at those hours anyways. And you told him that it needed to be done by 4, he needed to be out of there by 4, right? Mm -hmm. Because you had an inspection? Uh, Andrew was coming by, I knew he was uh, getting started to work early in the, that day, specifically. And that was the inspection, Andrew coming by? No, no, it was a uh, CNC table was coming in, so we were uh, trying to decide whether or not there was some plumbing um, that needed to be done to the shop in order to accommodate a CNC machine. Um, shop. Was it bloody in there? No. Why did you tell them to focus on the garage door handles and levers? Then? Those were the specific areas that were dirty. Those were the areas that you touched with your bloody hand? Those are the areas that car work is done. You saw the video of you coming back into the garage, right? Yes. You ran in and opened the third bay door. Yes. And after telling <clears throat> Alex, you had blood on your hands, right? No. You had blood on your hands, right? Yes. And you opened that door. Yes. And you knew Alex's blood would be on the handle and on the lock. That wasn't the forethought of my thinking. And that was why you asked Brandon, clean the garage between 3 and 4 and make sure you focus on the locks and the handles, right? Um, specifically, the hands were dirty when you work in the cars, um, and it tends to stick on those latches. And anybody who comes, usually when you're clean, such as we did, uh, I believe, in the video, we came back and as I was dressed nice, I touched those same handles that I also touch when I have dirty hands. And Let, so, I'm sorry, go ahead. And so... 
um, it wouldn't be outside of reasoning to clean all the locks and handles. And it, likewise, it wouldn't be outside of reasoning to remove evidence in a murder case, right? Such as? Such as blood on the handles. I didn't know there was blood on the handles. That wasn't my question. My question was, it wouldn't be outside of reasoning, would it? If I was guilty of murder, then no. And then you trashed your own Mercedes, right? Uh, no. Painted the outside of it? No. Smashed the mirrors? No. Removed the back seat? No. Well, then how'd all that happen? Uh, it's a high crime rate on the west end of Kentucky, mm -hmm. uh, west end of Lexington. And uh, a cherry Mercedes sitting out in that area um, can quickly be stripped of its tires, rims, um, back leather seats, anything. What was the car worth? I believe I bought it on paper for $1,000. What was it worth? 3200 Did you cheat on that one too, on the taxes? I believe or so. Was that a different car? No, it was about almost every car that I paid cash for, uh, I wrote down on the title that it was lower in value than I purchased it for. And when your uh, Mercedes was trashed like that, you called the police right away, right? Make a report? I mean, no, it, it had uh, it had problems anyways with the transmission and such uh, that would have costed much more than the car was worth. Could have called the police, right? Yes. That when it would have been the prudent thing to do under the circumstances if a person's vehicle was trashed in front of their home to call the police, right? It wasn't the first time my vehicle was trashed, and I didn't call the police on prior times either. And so you agreed, you asked Luis to jump the car for you. Yes. Is, now, is Luis the person in your phone contacts that you call Hispanic mechanic? Yes. And you sold him this trash Mercedes for a hundred bucks, right? Yes. And he wanted to fix it, didn't he? Uh, he wanted, he wants to fix everything, so. And you wouldn't let him, would you? Um, no, not this particular one. Why not? Because it was a junk car and it didn't really have a, a future. What does it matter to you if you sold it to him for a hundred bucks, if he wanted to take the time and effort to fix it? Uh, he could have. He could have very well taken it to his house and fixed it and told me that it was junked and, and been on with it. Do you think that by asking this guy to junk it instead of fix it, that it keeps it from being discovered by the police? No. Wasn't Alex's blood in the back seat of that vehicle? Uh, yes. So you knew that was evidence in this case, right? That was where Alex was when, um, when he died. And in fact, you tried to clean out the back seat of the car with bleach, right? Yes. And when that wouldn't work, that's why you trashed the vehicle, right? Uh, no. On the night that Alex was killed, a young woman came to your garage to buy marijuana. That would be Carly? Yes. Is that right? Had you sold marijuana to her before? Yes. And do you remember how Carly described uh, Mr. Ballard in the garage, what he was wearing? No. Do you remember what she described about what he had on his head? Uh, a hat. A ball cap? Yeah. Is that your recollection too? Mr. Ballard was wearing a ball cap that night? I don't remember much about the early parts of that night. <clears throat> and did you sell marijuana to Carly? Yes. And then after Carly left, you all left. Yes. And you all went out. Mr. Ballard was ahead of you, right? Going to the Mercedes? Yes. And Mr. Ballard walked around to the far side of the door, far side of the car, passenger back seat, opened the door for you to get in. Is that yes. right? So that's you, the second man we see. Yes, ma'am. And you're wearing a dark shirt and dark pants? Uh, or is that a coat? It's a, a North Face pullover, um, just a fleece. Is it down fleece? Yeah, I believe so. I had a white shirt underneath it. So dark shirt, dark pants. Yes. And you remember that Mr. Ballard was wearing white sweatpants? Yeah. That I, night? I believe I was wearing jeans, for the record. But yeah, he was wearing sweatpants. 
Oh, you were wearing jeans. Yes, ma'am. Okay, and he was wearing white sweatpants. Yes. And from there, you drive over to Hanover. Uh, there was one stop before. Uh, it's right on Richmond Road. Was that dropping stuff off? Yes, ma'am. And when you talk about dropping off these packages, are we talking about marijuana? Yes. Or cocaine? It was marijuana. Or Molly? Uh, Molly was more given as opposed to sold. Okay. They're all still against the law, though, right? Yes. Did you know um, that when you when this whole thing began, there was a woman that saw it happen at the time? No. And you had made arrangements to go out with Alex on that Saturday night, right? Or that night with to trust. Friday night, yes. Friday night to trust. Yes. So that was planned in advance. Yeah. Do you remember how the woman described the driver of the car as it was parked there and there was blood curdling scream coming from inside? Uh, a man, a large man. Right, big man. That would be Mr. Ballard, right? Yes. Wearing a ball cap. That would be Mr. Ballard, right? Yes. Not doing anything, right? Um, no. When you got to Spare Parts, who was driving? I was driving. You were driving. Because as you had pulled away from that first stop there on Hanover, you all switched drivers, right? No, it was the second stop where we switched. So I mean, as you pulled away and went to the second stop at Aurora and Hanover, the drivers were switched and you became the driver. If we could refer to that map right there, I could show you, I believe, approximately where it was. I'd like to refer to the video, actually. Okay. I'd like to look at the spare parts video. <laughs> I'm going to do the garage first. Turn down the lights. Can you see that? Yes. Whose truck is that? Uh, that is the red Ford. The one that he borrowed? Yes. What vehicle is that? That is the Mercedes. Now, you testified that Mr. Ballard borrowed this truck to move furniture. Is that right? That's why he had the truck. Okay. Well, why is it here now? Uh, I don't think he had an opportunity to return it yet. Right. Well, you all could have returned it now, right? Yeah, we could have. But instead, you chose to do it in the middle of the night? Um, this was right after, uh, this is right before Carly met me at the show. Right. So mm -hmm. I had something to do. Mm hmm um, and we figured we'd just get it back at some later date. And did you feel like it was more prudent to return that truck at, what, 3, 4 in the morning after you'd had cocaine, molly, and marijuana that night? I believe it was returned at 10 o'clock. Has you been to bed yet? No. Who is that getting out of the driver's side of the Mercedes? Me. And what are you going to do? Um, I'm going into the shop. Uh, Carly's headed there um, at the moment. Uh, I'm going to open up the, the garage door. So he can pull the truck inside? Yep. It was a, may I expand? No, I'm just saying, so you can pull the truck inside. So yeah. what, go ahead, tell it's, us. It's common practice for 
you know, to leave a car there. That general area is not really, other than being under surveillance, is not mm -hmm. exactly safe. So if you have something that you want to protect, you know, it's it's common to just pull it into the garage and close the door and lock it. It happens a lot. Right. And it could be common practice to pull the thing in so that when you put the barrel on it to haul it down to the river, nobody sees that happen, right? Mm -hmm. Over, overall. Right? Tim, Tim put the barrel on the, on the truck. And Tim drove it to the river. And Tim disposed of the body. I believe he testified to it. Who's that? Tim. Did you leave the lights on or something? Is that what that was about? I think it was left running. I think. So who's this coming in in the Camry? Carly. And her boyfriend. Who's that? It's me. And what are you getting out of the back of the vehicle? Oh, my backpack. Is that where the marijuana is? That's where I kept it, yeah.
how much did she buy that night? I believe it was an ounce. And how much did she pay for it? A hundred dollars. And who was that leaving? Uh, Carly and her boyfriend. Did you short her? I don't think so. Did she call you back about it? I think so, yes. And who is that in the frame now, walking? Tim. Can you see that he's wearing a ball cap? No. From that video? No. And you're getting into the back passenger, is that right? Yes. And he's driving? Yes. And this is when you leave to make one stop and then go on to Alex's? Yes. <coughs> Um, no. This is 8 o'clock? This is wrong. The time stamp on here is wrong. What? 17 minutes. So this is what time? It's after, that, uh, well, 17 is 7, so. 8, 10? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, see, I'm taking it right there. Um, I'm probably going back to my house. Because if I would have taken a left, uh, I would have gone down Richmond Road. All right, we're going to play part of the spare parts video. Somebody's hanging out of the back of that vehicle, right? Tim. And you're driving? Yes. When that door opens and that man gets out, that's you, right? Yes, ma'am. And you're about to open the back door, yeah. back seat door. Can you see the silhouette of the man in that car? Yes. Do you see what he's doing? Seems like he's throwing punches. Raising and lowering his arm? Yes. Do you hear the testimony of medical examiner? Yes. You know how many times Alex was struck in the head? How many? Over 20. Have you counted how many strikes this man in the car is using in the back seat of that car? No. <coughs> that man is you, isn't it? Yes.
Who's walking around to the driver's side? I just pulled Tim out of the car. Who's walking around to the driver's side? Tim. So now he's in the front seat of the car? Yes. And you're on the far side of the car? Yes. And you see what the guy on the far side of the car is doing? You see that arm going up and down and up and down again? Yes. Mr. Ballard's driving, right? Yes. All right, this is the vehicle, the Mercedes returning to the garage. Who is that getting out and running inside? To me. Bay door do you open? The third.
driving the truck now? Tim. What's on the back of the truck? Barrel. And what's in the barrel? Alex. It's the last time I saw Alex. How long was Mr. Ballard gone? Approximately 50 minutes. Who opened the door for him to return? Who's driving the truck when it leaves this time? Tim. Tim always drove the truck. Is that you driving the Mercedes? Yes. Okay, now it looks like you've changed clothes. No. Taken off your jacket? Yeah. Taken off your pants? No. You're not wearing dark pants anymore? jacket. I believe it's in the car. And then it's sometime after this that you all go to trust. Is that right? For the party? Yeah.
you were arrested in Far, Texas on January 22nd. Is that right? Yes. Planning on going into Mexico? I was thinking about it. Had these heavy duty suitcases, right? Would you like for me to explain their use? No, I'm asking you, did you have heavy duty suitcases? They weren't suitcases, but yes. Had your clothes wrapped up in Ziploc bags or plastic bags or something? Uh, it was just sometimes how I stored them. Had your clothes locked up in Ziploc or plastic bags, yes. right? Yes. Had cash, how much? Uh, $10,000. How much marijuana? Two pounds. You had your birth certificate with you? Yeah. In case you got across and wanted to come back, right? I think an ID is sufficient, but yeah. But you had your birth certificate with you? Yes, ma'am. And you told this jury that you were going down there to meet a new supplier or an old supplier? Uh, not necessarily. It was somebody who a um, friend of a friend connected me with who supplied marijuana. So you, were you down there to buy marijuana uh, in addition to maybe going into Mexico? Possibly, but you don't go into Mexico with drugs. You don't. And you had guns? Yes. Two guns? Yeah, after that happened, I kept guns on me all the time. And you had two books? Yes. What were those books? Objection, y'all ready, we approach.
takeaway you went there were two books, right? Yes, ma'am. The first is photographed in Commonwealth Exhibit 96. It's a book called The Smuggler's Ghost, When Marijuana Turned a Florida Teen into a Millionaire. Mm -hmm. Did you read that book? Uh, no, I had just purchased it uh, a day and a half before. Mm -hmm. Were you hoping marijuana would, want, would turn you into a millionaire? No, that's Florida's version of the bluegrass conspiracy. And then the other book you had was this, The Prince by Machiavelli. Yes. Had you read that one? Yeah. Checked it out at the library, did you? I think it's Lexington Public Library. When did you check it out? Um, I don't know. Before the murder or after? No, long before. Long before? Yes. Was it overdue? Possibly. You know what the central theme of that book is, don't you? Um, statesmanship. How about the ends justify the means? Do you know that to be the central theme? No. Do you know what the, who the prince is in that book? Uh, yeah. Isn't he a person who thinks that in order to maintain his surroundings, he can do whatever Objection. needs to be done? about right the ends justify the means um i think it has a lot of different theories i don't i didn't pull that from it but regarding that theory the end justify the means are those the words that you live by no. i mean it seemed to me that you indicated to this jury that when your mother was sick and you needed money mm -hmm. it justified engaging in illegal activity to get the money <laughs> right yeah. to sell drugs isn't that the ends justify the means Yes. And when you came to Lexington and you needed income <clears throat> to live the lifestyle you wanted to live, you resorted to selling marijuana, cocaine, and molly. Isn't that true? No. Selling marijuana and cocaine to make money. To make money, yes. But I had a nine to five in all of those times um, to, for my rent, for my electric, for cars for things like that. I, I had a, a job that I paid taxes with. and You're not telling this jury you didn't make money selling marijuana? Of course I did, yes. Yeah. And the ends justify the means, right? If you would like to apply it there, then yes. <coughs> How much money did you make in a week selling marijuana? Uh, $1,000, maybe two. Pay taxes on that? No. So two thousand dollars a week. How much At, is that a year? On a good week, um, it's about uh, one hundred and eight thousand dollars a year. One hundred and four thousand dollars a year. Without paying taxes. Yes. That's a good amount of change, isn't it? Yes. You knew who Alex's supplier was in North Carolina, right? Yes. Part of our. Uh, Part of what was going on, his, his transition out of the business, was that I met his suppliers um, and, uh, and his, the people he sold to. And you say he was getting out of business, right? Yes. Because his girlfriend was afraid for him. She didn't like him being involved, right? It's a common thing that happens with people who find a reason to get out. Um, usually they start in a business like this because they don't have anything um, girlfriend-wise, uh, they don't have a reason uh, to, to be straight and legit. They have free time. Um, but usually when you find a reason, uh, particularly a female, someone who you'd like to spend the rest of your life with, uh, you tend to wind down your involvement in illegal activity in order to hedge your exposure to being caught, to, being, to serving jail time, to things like that. 
and uh, I believe Alex had made a considerable sum of money um, in this business, and he saw me as a capable successor. But Alex Johnson wouldn't be the first person to tell someone that he loved that he was doing something when he really wasn't doing objection. it, right? I wouldn't I'll, know. I'll sustain that objection. I wouldn't know. Well, you just told us that you knew all about what people do when they're winding down, it, right? I just said it's a general thing. Um, I did it myself in Florida um, when I was selling marijuana and I found a girlfriend that I was, uh, saw a future with. Then I proceeded to wind down my involvement in legal activity in order to create a better life with my partner. It's just something that happens. Is that before you wound it back up here in Lexington? I didn't have anything to stop me. You say you spoke to Mr. Ballard on Christmas Day while he was at your family's home. Yes. And he made some veiled, it sounds to me like you're claiming he mailed some veiled threat regarding your nephew, right? Yes. Yeah. You called the police right away, didn't you? Of course not. Why not? I mean, it, this sounds like it's really hitting home to you now. It wasn't worth calling the police at this point to say what Ballard's involvement was in this? At this point in time. Uh, he was in my, my aunt and uncle's house um, playing whatever part that he was playing. Um, he knew his involvement in this and was around, was around the most intimate parts of my family. And when he left the house that day, you called the police, right? No. Um, as per the instructions by my, uh, by my attorney at the time, I was to avoid all contact with police and uh, not stay at my house. And you don't think your attorney wouldn't have wanted you to protect your family if it really came down to Objection, that? Objection, speculation. No, it's I told my attorney as of the happening. Your Honor, you just objected to my question. Instruct Mr. Taylor to stop answering. Right. I sustain the objection. <coughs> I sustain the objection, Mr. Taylor. I apologize, sir. You were here on New Year's Eve. Yes. Had a big party to Hugo's. Uh, a friend of mine, Nick, was had a table. Um, a, another good friend of ours was DJing, not Crow, and another one. His name is DJ Da Vinci, and uh, uh, I went in on a bottle with him, which was approximately one hundred and twenty-five dollars. On December twenty-first at six fifty-two in the morning, this would have been after Alex was killed. You sent some text messages to Mr. Ballard. Do you remember that? No. This is a hard copy of the <coughs> digital report of your cell phone that's been previously introduced. This is a text message, December 21st. If you do the time right, it is exactly at 6.52 in the morning to Tiny Tim B. Is that Tim Ballard? Yes. Okay. And this is your text to him. What was that text message? Love ya over at David's at the moment. Love ya over at David's at the moment, right? Yes. Yeah. And Mr. Ballard replied? Uh, make sure I have the car by 10 a.m. And you replied, so you sent him another text? Already there, baby. Already there, baby. And then Mr. Ballard responded to you and said, Okay, cool, enjoy yourself, love you. Okay, cool, enjoy yourself, love you. Yes. These are text messages between you and a guy you said you could never be friends with? Uh, this is a, an attempt to pacify a man who has a very bad temper. By your own words, Mr. Taylor, you are a major drug dealer. There are much greater drug dealers than I am. By your own words, Mr. Taylor, you are a major drug dealer, right? Yes. yes. And if you killed Alex Johnson, you'd be even bigger drug dealer, wouldn't you? No. That's all. Any redirect? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay, Mark, just a few things about the GS. Okay. Um, 
Ms. Redcorn questioned you about seeing the evidence, correct? And you were shown the evidence, weren't you? Yes. And she int intimated that, in fact, then you made up your story. Your Honor, may we approach the bench, please? In regards to Ms. Redcorn's question, have you made up this story? No. Have you and I discussed your story many times? Yes. Now, when you talk about your previous, one thing I do want to make clear, when you talk about your previous attorney, you're not talking about me, are you? No, ma'am. Or Mr. Clark? No. Okay. When after Mr. Johnson died, after he was murdered, okay, so Mr. Ballard, <coughs> the times that you texted his line, what was the con what condition were you in? Uh, unstable. When between the time of December the twentieth, two thousand and thirteen, until you were taken into custody in Texas. What was your drug intake? Uh, higher than normal. Um, there were periods of time uh, over days that I didn't go to sleep. Um, it's extremely stressful. Uh, I was running from my own self. When you were with your family, were you doing as many drugs as when you weren't? No. Now, in the trust video, you talked to, you were asked about uh, the VIP lounge. Mm -hmm. When you went, you've been to the trust before. Yes. When you went to trust before, did you sit in the VIP lounge? No. Why does not? Um, Although Jordan had DJed at Trust before, uh, this was a particularly opportun uh, an opportunity for him to um, have a residency there on Friday nights, which is money, and money for him is good. Had these arrangements been pr made prior to you going to Trust? Yes. You're not denying you tried to clean the car up, are you? No. You're not denying that you wanted the garage cleaned up, are you? No. I want to ask you about some of the things that were referred to in the video. <clears throat> and you said that when you went back into that area that you call a parking lot, um, that you were, you were driving, correct? Yes. And you got out. And on the video, you could be seen hitting something. Yes. What were you hitting? Were you hitting Alex? No. Oh. What were you hitting? Tim was over top of... Alex in the back seat of the car. Um, Tim's long frame, six foot seven, that's why his legs were sticking out because he was, his head was touching the, the door on the other side of the car. Um, when I, I stopped uh, because I heard that sound that Tim referred to, the gurgling. When I opened up that door, it was the only thing I could do to get Tim off of Alex was to hit him multiple times in the back of his head. If there were pictures of the back of his head on any of those videos, I could show you. I believe it drew blood. If I could show you my hands that night, I believe that that they were busted. And after hitting him several times, did in fact Mr. Ballard get off of Alex. Yes. After I went around to the, the back side of the car, I pulled Tim off because he was a, a very 
uh, cumbersome man. He put all of his weight on Alex um, and subdued him. I mean, he he smothered Alex essentially with his body. Now, Mr. Edborn talked about what you had in your suitcase. Do you remember the first time you read The Prince? Yes. When was it? It was in high school. Okay. Required reading? Uh, excuse me? Was it required reading? Yes, ma'am. Uh, you read history books? Yes. Civil War books? Yes. Did you ever want to be a Civil War reenactor? No, not necessarily. Um, read books about World War II? Yes. Did you ever want to be a soldier? Now, there's also something made about you continuing to keep up a social life during between the time Alex was killed and the time you were you uh, were picked up in Texas, right? Yes. Uh, why'd you do that? Uh, at the time, it was the only thing that really made me feel normal. Um, I had seen, I had seen my best friend die by the hands of a man that I felt like I could not control anymore. And and being around people and distracting my mind is the only thing, is the only way that I could pass my time through friends, through, through drugs, through aimless conversation, whatever it was, anything to distract me from what, from what happened. Now, Mr. Edcorn asked you about paying taxes. Yeah. Um, you've known other drug <clears throat> people that deal in drugs as a business, as their business. Okay. Do you ever know one of them to have an accountant? No. As you sit here today, are you, you're not, are you, telling anybody in this room that what you did was right? No. Are you telling anyone in this room that you behaved in a manner that was honorable? It was cowardly. That's all I have. Anybody cross? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you, sir. You may step down.